We have some hiccups yesterday, so I hope that you are now rested, that you can find, you know, uh, a nice room to rest and a, a nice dinner to uh, relax and had a good sleep to be this morning here with your kids and eyes. Hello, uh, thưa quý vị, đây là lễ khai mạc Hội nghị Thượng đỉnh Thế giới Những người bảo vệ nhân quyền tại Paris, Cộng hòa Pháp uh, Tôi xin gửi đến quý vị lời chào và mong quý vị sẽ theo dõi cái lễ khai mạc này Uh, also limited capacity for attendance, so if we start changing the the session we choose, we might have some hiccups in terms of uh, accommodating all of you. Also in terms of the sessions, make sure that you may be there 10, 15 minutes before, so you can start on time. For reimbursements, for those who didn't get your per diems yesterday or need to handle your boarding passes, there's a room uh, on level minus one behind the lunch room. For lunch, we are going to have two uh, services. And the first service is for names from A to L, and it starts at 12.30. And the second one started, starts at 1.30, and it goes from the, uh, L to Z. For this evening, uh, the Paris Bar Association will offer a dinner for all of us. Uh, and so buses will come uh, here to pick us up to get us there. We'll have more information in exact times after lunch, so uh, more to come. And then if you experience any situation that doesn't respond to the principles that we share as a, to create this as a safe space, or need emotional support or uh, that require our intervention, please I want to ask the members of the well-being working group to stand up so we can appoint them. Uh, Wada Marengo on the back from Amnesty, Puja from Patel from the International Service over there, Michelle Foley from Frontline Defenders, I myself. So please feel free to reach out to us. We have, as you have already seen, an amazing team of volunteers that we also are uh, available to help you and guide you through the space. If you have any questions, don't know to get, uh, I don't know, you need to take some, you have a headache, please approach them so we can help you. Then, uh, other matters that I would like to remind you, we have, don't forget, we have this digital security clinic, so you can get, you know, some help in terms of digital security <laughs> advice. You need uh, something to look up into your phone, and you don't know how to solve that. So the, that's in the main hall, and there will be people available in English, uh, French, and Spanish, and, and some basic Russian. In terms of photos and video in the space. You know that while photos and video are not permitted at the summit, we also want to bear in mind that there are people that really ask us to not be visible in terms of uh, documenting any sort of documenting in the summit. So they will have been we have in their badges a red triangle. So please uh, make sure that you don't you don't make them appear in photos and videos. Uh, and for those people that are requested for not appearing, we'll have, for the plenary live stream, we'll have uh, seats that are marked with a white stripe. So make sure you sit there for not being uh, live stream or videotaped. We are also having portraits of HRDs. For the ones who have accepted that, Please make sure to stick to the, to the schedules that you were proposed. And if you were in approach and want to be on those uh, portraits, you can go 
to room five in the basement and find the photographers to appoint you and uh, a time for for that. Then we'll have our colleagues from True Heroes that will be documenting the summit in video. Uh, and they are interested also in having individual moments with you. So if you are interested, please, you can also approach them and, and have a time for an interview with them. A very important announcement is about interpretations because we have an amazing team of pro bono translators on the back and in the parallel sessions and in the, um, throughout the discussions. We are having interpretations. Yeah. Make sure the dialogue is happening actually here. So thank you for them. And, and so make sure to say when you speak in the parallel sessions and, and the regional sessions, make sure to say please your name, where you come from, the language you are going to speak, because they can get prepared. There's no delays and hiccups in the conversation. Um, then make sure to follow the agenda and time so the sessions don't run over. It's really important for interpreters also to have breaks and to have the ability to switch. Uh, so bear in mind the times in the agenda. And if you really need to really extend, please make sure there's going to be a coordinator of the interpreters in each room. So make sure to ask them if that's a possibility. And the final decision will be on interpreters to go over the time for that. So thank you. In terms of channels, uh, one in, in your devices, translation interpretation devices, one is for English, two for French, three Spanish, four Russian, and five Arabic. I'm going just two more minutes and then I'll hand it over to Nawal for our opening plenary. You know that we have our action plan within the summit to discuss uh, the process it's been first of all reviewing the expectations that we were hoping to hear from you on on what you were hoping to have as a, a, we are the, at the outcomes of the summit and we also were reviewing the 1998 plan that came out from the first world summit to kind of see what was going on at that time and what we need to still do and what we need to change and we elaborated from both those inputs a first draft that went out to um, the, the consultative organizations attending the summit and all of you for input. And that's as we came up with the draft that you finally received the last week. There's still time for incorporations of changes, uh, like some things that we think are weak or we need to elaborate more on this and that. The copies of the action plan will be delivered as well in the regional sessions this afternoon. So we can all, you can also start bearing in, bearing in mind the discussions, uh, what we need to be flagged in terms for changes of the action plan. We have an action plan working group as well. So I would like them to identify Andrea Proca from Frontline Defenders of the back, Lisa Maracani from Amnesty International, Katia Ru from Amnesty France, over there in my left, and myself as well. So I would like uh, you to tell us if you have any red flags for the action plan, any suggestions that need to be made. You can have three ways for doing that. Approaches, as all. Well. You can look at them during the day, and you can uh, go to the meeting room at the Ibis Hotel, the Ibis Bastille Hotel, downstairs and you can find us there as well or a may Javier that we already know so Javier where are you not here but <laughs> you can email Javier and, and send your input for the action plan and there will be a process also that also will be explained today in the regional sessions as well for that I think that's all thank you very much uh, we wish you well during the three days and welcome to Paris And welcome to the Human Rights Defenders World Summit 2018. Um, I'm Noelle McCarthy, and I'm a correspondent and filmmaker at the BBC. 
And for the last couple of years, I've been traveling across the Middle East, and particularly to my country of origin, Yemen, to, to do my best to tell the stories of those that have lost their Xin chào quý vị và chúc mừng quý vị đã tới hội nghị quốc tế với tất cả, cả những người dân chủ. Tôi tên là Nguyễn, thuộc đại BBC. Và trong vòng 3 ngày chúng ta sẽ trao đổi rất nhiều về vấn đề. Human rights defenders come in so many different forms. I've met journalists, local journalists like myself, in places like Syria and Iraq, doing what they can to highlight the human rights abuses in the countries they come, they come from. But unlike me, it's often at great risk to themselves. I've met lawyers defending victims of abuses, whistleblowers exposing malpractice, and women's rights and activists and feminists teachers fighting for the right for education for the young ones. Um, what we do as human rights defenders is essential in upholding freedoms and human rights across the world. And by supporting our rights and protecting the space in which we live in and we work in, it means one of the most crucial ways to guarantee human rights for all. And hopefully that's what we're going to be discussing over this summit in the next few days. It's an absolute privilege for me to be amongst all of you today, and I'll be taking you through the events. We have a list of very distinguished speakers and a very interesting panel that will be coming up. Um, but first on my list, please uh, join me in welcoming the International Federation for Human Rights Secretary General and the Director of Ditswanelo, the Botswana Center for Human Rights, Alice Mokwe. <laughs> Tiếp theo đây là bà Alice Mowe, tổng thư ký của Liên hiệp uh, các uh, tổ chức nhân quyền trên thế giới. Bonjour. Bonjour. Xin chào mọi người. Uh, buenos dias. Sabah al Sabah That's how far I go. <laughs> and I've, I've extended the limits of my language capacity and I deeply apologize to the interpreters and those who are causing confusion. Um, greetings to each and every one of you and a very warm welcome indeed um, to this Human Rights Defenders World Summit, the second one. And a particularly warm welcome to those of you Xin chúc mừng tất cả các bạn ở đây. Đây là lần thứ nhì chúng ta làm tổ chức hội nghị như vậy. Và xin cảm ơn tất cả những người đi từ khắp nơi trên thế giới để dự hội nghị này đến từ rất xa. Cách đây 20 năm, Liên hiệp và Nhân quyền quốc tế và một số tổ chức khác giống như là Ân xã quốc tế đã tổ chức cái hội nghị đầu tiên năm 1998 nhân dịp 50 năm cái mục tiêu nhân quyền năm 1998 là lần đầu tiên tổ chức cái hội nghị này to create an opportunity for public debate and concrete commitments which would quote unquote transcend cultural barriers and social divisions. Năm 1998, rất nhiều tổ chức nhân sự và tổ chức nhân quyền trên quốc tế đã trao đổi uh, hội nghị về nhân quyền trên khắp thế giới và đưa ra một số cái mục đích to guarantee the implementation of the declaration. Two, Thứ nhất là làm sao phải bảo vệ nhân quyền trên khắp thế giới và hỗ trợ những công việc mà các nhà dân chủ đang thực hiện trên khắp thế giới và kêu gọi các quốc gia trên thế giới ủng hộ các việc làm của nhà dân chủ. Include our civil society contribution towards the development of a global institutional framework. Những kết quả là sau khi hội nghị thứ nhất, 
có rất nhiều tổ chức đã tiếp tục tranh uh, đấu để bảo vệ nhân quyền khắp thế giới và luật pháp quốc tế cũng đang bắt đầu thay đổi để bảo vệ những nhà dân chủ những nhà đang bị đàn áp tại liên hợp quốc tại các châu phi và nam mỹ In the last 20 years, we have seen an increasing number of organizations and individuals who defend human rights. Từ 20 năm nay, có càng ngày càng nhiều người đứng lên để giao tranh đấu cho nhân quyền trên khắp thế giới và tổ chức xuất hiện lên. As 2018 marks the 20th year since the adoption of the UN Declaration on Human Rights, năm 2018. Sau 20 năm, tổ chức tổ hội nghị đầu tiên, một số tổ chức trên thế giới như là Ấn Sa Quốc tế, tổ chức chống tra tấn khắp thế giới, Frontline Defenders, cao cao quỹ quốc tế nhưng mà tiền hành đã không vì không nhân giới đã đồng ý tổ chức hội nghị thứ nhì bảo vệ nhân quyền hội nghị nhằm mục đích vạch ra những cái sách lược để tranh đấu cho nhân quyền cho những năm tới trên khắp thế giới. Hội nghị này diễn ra trong lúc mà rất nhiều người, nhà dân chủ, người bảo vệ nhân quyền đang bị đàn áp trên khắp thế giới. Càng ngày càng nhiều người thiếu số đang tranh đấu cho quyền lợi của họ những tổ chức dân sự trên phía châu kêu gọi sự giúp đỡ trong 20 năm qua có một số tiến bộ cũng đã đạt được trên vài nơi và lĩnh vực dân sự, tổ chức dân sự và tổ chức uh, cho, trong trung vùng. Nhưng ngày càng có nhiều cái dấu, chỉ dấu cho thấy là nhân quyền đang bị đe dọa trên khắp thế giới. Trên nhiều nước, cái sự tự do của mọi người càng ít hơn, càng ngày càng nhiều người bị ám sát, đặc biệt những người bảo vệ nhân quyền. Impunity of perpetrators of violations, the limitations of protection mechanisms, as well as the collusion of state and non-state actors. However, in the midst of all that, it is important to recognize that the backlash itself symbolizes a recognition of our power and of our victories. Những sự đe dọa, những sự khó khăn của nhà dân, các nhà dân quyền cũng thể hiện ra là những cái sự tiến bộ, những chiến thắng của những người tranh đấu cho nhân quyền 
Tại vì vì vậy những nhà dân độc tài họ mới trả đũa bằng cách đàn áp những người, người bảo vệ nhân quyền khắp thế giới. Để, để gãy lại cái xu hướng này, chúng ta phải tìm ra những sách lược mới. Phải tìm ra những cách tranh đấu mới. Dùng những cái hashtag để báo động thế giới. Chúng ta cũng cần phải đấu tranh bền bỉ để bảo vệ những người đang tranh đấu cho nhân quyền. Chúng ta chúng ta đang thay đổi thế giới. <cười> Tôi muốn kết thúc bằng cách nói rằng năm 98, hồi đó, hội nghị thứ nhất nói rằng qua những trận đấu hàng ngày, chúng ta thấy rằng ước mơ nhân quyền sẽ được thể uh, hiện trên thế giới và chúng ta cần phải tiếp tục như vậy. The UN General Assembly reaffirmed the UN Declaration of Human Rights defenders 20 years ago, like Alice just mentioned. The Declaration placed the responsibility on states to implement and respect all of its provisions, particularly the duty to protect defenders from harm as a consequence of their work. Now, 20 years on, we want to discuss how have we progressed, what are the challenges still facing human rights defenders today? And we have a very distinguished panel that's come from all over the world to tell you about their experience and what they think we need to do to make the situation better. So please join me in welcoming Bosha Bilhaj Hameda, who's come all the way from Tunisia, from the Individual Freedoms and Equality Committee. Kirill <laughs> Khartib, who's come all the way from Russia, from the Human Rights Center Memorial. Pierre Kleber Monipa, and I'm so sorry I probably pronounced that wrong, who's come all the way from Burundi, from the Association for the Protection of Human Rights. Vilma Nunes has come all the way from Nicaragua, from the Nicaraguan Centre for Human Rights. And Henry Tifani, who's come from People Watch all the way in India. Vilma, you were 
here 20 years ago in the first ever summit for human rights defenders. I mean, what was the vision, Jeff, then? Eh, quizás hace 20 años también había muchos problemas en materia de derechos humanos y a nivel de la América Latina se eh, desarrollaba ya un movimiento de derechos humanos integrado por defensores, sobre todo en el Foro Sur, luchando en contra de la dictadura. Binma, Núñez, Estocia, Đến Tình Đức, Nicaragua, Và hiện diện ở hội nghị đầu tiên cách đây năm 1998. Và nhắc lại những cái vấn đề mà Nam Mỹ đã phải gặp lại, gặp qua, trải qua trong 20 năm qua với rất nhiều trường hợp vi phạm nhân quyền tại nước Chile, nước Argentina. San Mado, Guatemala có rất nhiều người trong những nước gia đó vì bảo vệ nhân quyền đã bảo mạng Había vivido 
1996 y 1985-96, este, no, me, me llegó a la conclusión que efectivamente el desarrollo jurídico de los derechos humanos no son concesiones graciosas ni de gente iluminada, ni de expertos, ni de técnicos, son producto de la lucha de los pueblos. Fueron precisamente la gente que defendía a los eh, excluidos, que defendía a las víctimas de tanta represión, que eh, veía cómo era un riesgo empezar a impulsar eh, el respeto a los derechos humanos, lo que hicieron posible esta declaración. Esa es la impresión que tengo. Henry, if you can tell me a bit, a bit, a bit about the situation for human rights defenders in India right now, have you seen any progress? Well, um, I'm coming to this conference in a very difficult situation. <coughs> when many of the colleagues who <coughs> <don't coughs> in our platform of human rights defenders said that uh, four days ago, after enjoying a house arrest by the Supreme Court of India from the 28th of August, and today in prison, when we are here gathered for the World Summit, I wish to name them Sudha Bharadwaj of the People's Union for Civil Liberties, Arun Ferreira, Vernon Gonzalez, and many, many, many others. I want to remember that at this time, three days ago, the Amnesty International in India's office was raided for 10 hours. Three weeks ago, it was the Green Pieces office in the same city of Bangalore that was also raided, not for offenses under the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, not for offenses under the Income Tax Act. Because those are legislations that we have been able to continuously fight. This time it has been on enforcement directory of the government of India. Therefore, the situation in India is no longer that of shrinking democratic space. Unfortunately, however I wish it is different, it is a situation of closed democratic space. We have colleagues here sitting from Jammu and Kashmir who could not come to Geneva and were in prison for seven days, Kuram Parvez from Jammu and Kashmir was speaking. We have a number of colleagues who never come to Geneva or came to Geneva and couldn't enter back because they were lookout notices against them. Therefore, the situation of the country is extremely bad. We are called anti-development activists. We are called traitors. And we are called foreign agents in the democratic India that we belong to. And as we come closer to the elections of 2019, Unfortunately, I don't see the attack going to be on political parties. I see the attack increasing on many of us. And we hope that that is something that we can curtail. That is unfortunately the situation. The other unfortunate part is that this democratic country, which belongs to the non-aligned movement, is today willing to align with a number of countries which stand against the civil society and they do it blatantly in council after council. I see UN special rapporteurs having to face a number of difficulties for the stance they take in standing with human rights defenders on issues relating to India. The threats of visitors, of special rapporteurs who visit India and the harassment they face which they can't speak, but that is the truth when they come to India. Human rights defenders are a receiving community. You call them by any name. You have perhaps the largest number of activists who work on right to information who are killed every year in large numbers in this country. I'm not going to get into land rights activists or environmental activists. Therefore, while we from India would be very happy to applaud the UN Special Rapporteurs, Hina, Margaret and Michael for expanding this realm of rights that we have. I think the states in the last 10 years 
again to ensure that those rights that we were celebrating and trying to expand and trying to expand our own communities with bringing in trade unionists, bringing in students, bringing in a variety of other activists who usually were not termed human rights defenders. We are now in the last 10 years closer to the 20th year losing much of what we gained. I want to tell you and quote a colleague of mine who is in this hall from Bangladesh who says today we belong to a category of persecuted NGOs. Adil's term. NGOs who cannot function. NGOs who seem to be acting as if we are functioning. I function from an organization which doesn't have a bank account which is open for 1400 days. 1400 days. And my accusation on an affidavit by the government of India in court is that I have communicated. I have communicated with UN special rapporteurs. This is in writing. And with embassies because I was leading UPR generated work. Unfortunately, that is India. But that is that going on in India repeats in Bangladesh, repeats in Sri Lanka repeats in Pakistan. We might have small periods of happiness in Maldives, in Malaysia. I hope they are not as temporary as what Sri Lanka has been with what has happened just three days ago. so much for that, Henry. Um, Carol, we know the situation is quite uh, visible for human rights defenders in Russia. But tell me, what is it like working as a human rights lawyer in Moscow? His organization and his colleagues have been uh, called foreign agents. Well, that is something I know all too well. It's exactly how my organization was branded uh, four years ago in Moscow, Russia, and a lot of my friends and colleagues know this uh, label all too well. And it comes. It, it was borrowed by the current Russian government from the Communist Party language of 1930s of the Great Terror uh, by Stalin and his government. And um, as we speak today here uh, in Moscow, at the same time. People come to the famous or famous Lubyanka Square where the KGB and NKVD, the Soviet secret police, was located. They come uh, every year on 29th October to read the names of those perished in the Great Terror. And every year more and more people come and they have probably only a couple of names to read out so that thousands can join. Uh, that is a huge uh, source of hope that more and more people engage in this act of memory, but that also reminds us that holding a uh, human rights defenders summit in the Communist Party headquarters is a huge scandal. And um, the cheapest option is not the best. It's one of the really uh, one of the few worst places in the world to hold a human rights defender summit. But if there is some uh, good heritage the Communist Party left us is the experience of resistance to communist dictatorship. And that is something that also informs our work today. Uh, in Russia and my friends and colleagues in other countries uh, from the Soviet Union and beyond that. And uh, resistance to communist dictatorship has been, uh, by Soviet dissidents, has been legalistic and non-partisan because of that. 
so that the uh, communist government complied with legal obligation it has taken internationally or domestically, focusing often on procedural issues so that there is fair trial regardless of everyone's convictions, so that there, um, there is open trials, there is a uh, possibility to uh, cross-examine witnesses and um, Soviet dissidents aren't only the typewriters uh, created or produced or contributed to human rights law as we know now, as we now know it. And unlike uh, people in my country um, in the 70s, for example, we are now able to file cases to uh, international courts. Uh, in, in Russia, it's the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, whose judgments are more, more honored in Britain and observance. But, well, uh, it is not only the only court troubled by Russia and also other governments join in disregarding and undermining the authority of the court. And the same happens in the Americas, I, as I understand, because African, oh, sorry, uh, Inter-American Commission and Inter-American Court are under impressive pressure from American governments to, again, undermine their ability to work and to establish uh, human rights uh, violations and to provide redress for them. And African Commission's case has been mentioned earlier today. So uh, we had huge improvements in um, uh, human rights law thanks to these courts over the last 20 years, whether it's right to life and prohibition of torture, whether it's criminal procedure, whether it's fight against human trafficking or privacy or, for example, uh, environment. But what we need to understand uh, is that these courts, these uh, international courts, while they need our support and well, now than ever they need the government's support, which is lacking. They will not create a uh, uh, functioning democratic system, functioning uh, in, independent judiciary in our countries instead of us. And as I speak, my colleague from uh, uh, Memorial Grozny office, Oyub Titiev, is in prison on trumped up charges of drug possession. And his predecessor in that position, Natalia Istimirov, was murdered in 2009. And uh, our colleagues from uh, uh, Mission of World Committee Against Torture, who had their office in Grozny, had it burned twice. And their car also was burned uh, on another occasion. So, uh, in the face of this uh, counter repression, it is our task to repute uh, our judiciary, our police, our society, uh, and still, uh, thanks to modern technologies, we are able to reach to more and more people, more now than ever. We Possess means that are even more powerful than typewriters our predecessors had. And if with the typewriters, uh, people like Sergei Kovalev, Alexander Yisenin Volpin, and others uh, overthrew communist dictatorship, I think uh, despite all the dangers and all the troubles, uh, we may engage with much more people, and this means we are more powerful nevertheless, uh, and we are, I hope, more able prepared for a democratic debate, even if the government stifles it. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> we saw a 
wave of change spread across the Middle East and North Africa during the Arab Spring. Um, has the situation improved in Tunisia? And also, you wear another hat, you're also a member of parliament. So, does the UN declaration support the work you do? Đây là bà Bushra Beha Mita, những biểu từ đến từ Tunisia. La situation en Tunisie, c'est quand même assez paradoxal. C'est assez étonnant. Ça n'a rien à voir avec ce que vous venez de dire. Je pense, du moins, c'est mon appréciation. Parce que je trouve que je suis député censé être député du pouvoir, entre guillemets. Et je suis, euh, j'ai été nommé par le président de la République comme président de la Commission afin de proposer des réformes concernant la question de l'égalité et de liberté individuelle. Donc, mes collègues et moi, nous étions neuf, nous sommes censés être largement protégés puisque nous sommes issus du pouvoir. Or, euh, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que la situation en Tunisie, bien sûr, elle a énormément changé. Il y a des amis ici, défenseurs des droits de l'homme, on ne peut pas dire aujourd'hui qu'en Tunisie, il y a une persécution des défenseurs des droits de l'homme, on ne peut pas dire qu'ils sont euh, victimes de, de harcèlement ou de persécution ou d'arrestation, mais il y a un changement réel dans la société. C'est-à-dire que les Tunisiens et Tunisiennes, voyant la révolution arriver, peut-être sont un peu déçus que, de, que leur vécu n'est pas vraiment changé. Il n'y a pas un vrai changement dans l'air de cul sur la, la question du chômage, la question de la cherté de la vie, etc. Et voilà qu'on a une constitution qui garantit les droits humains. Et voilà que les lois de protection des droits humains se succèdent. Nous avons voté une loi intégrale contre les violences à l'égard des femmes au Parlement. Nous avons voté dernièrement, bien sûr, l'instance, la mise en place de l'instance des droits humains, c'est une instance constitutionnelle. Nous avons voté aussi l'accès à la formation, qui est une loi très importante. Nous avons voté aussi la loi de lutte contre le racisme. Nous avons voté la loi de lutte contre la traite des humains. Donc, tout le corpus, une grande partie du corpus législatif garantissant les droits humains, sont, sont, il est là. Il est là aujourd'hui et on commence à avoir une mise en œuvre de ce corpus. Une des recommandations ou nécessités pour garantir euh, les droits humains et assurer la protection des défenseurs, c'est aussi l'éducation aux droits humains. Or, toutes ces lois prévoient et imposent à l'État la mise en œuvre de programmes d'éducation aux droits humains et on commence réellement à voir les programmes et de la réforme de la police mais ça ne veut pas dire que tout est fait. Tout, il y a plein de choses qui restent à faire, notamment tous les mécanismes de défenseurs des droits humains, au niveau de la prévention, au niveau de mettre en œuvre les moyens. On parle de moyens matériels, de financiers, même parfois des locaux, etc. Mais ce qui est étonnant, ce qui est paradoxal, c'est que partie de la société devient une menace pour les défenseurs des droits humains. Et c'est ça, peut-être, ce que je n'ai pas entendu de la part de mes, nos amis. Aujourd'hui, après la sortie du rapport sur euh, les, les libertés individuelles et l'égalité, où nous avons abordé des questions qui étaient considérées comme tabou jusque-là, notamment la question de l'égalité dans l'héritage, l'abolition de la peine de mort, euh, la question aussi de la dépénalisation de l'homosexualité, et plein d'autres questions. Et pas ben, la réaction d'une partie de la société, notamment les religieux, entre guillemets, était d'une violence. Et tout ce que vous avez dit tout à l'heure, vous, ce que vous, les menaces 
Est-ce que vous appelez aussi, quand vous, quand vous taxe de traître, quand vous taxe de mécréant, quand vous menace de mort, il n'est pas venu de l'État, il est venu de ces groupes religieux. Il est venu des imams dans les mosquées qui ont stigmatisé les membres de la commission et notamment ma personne. Imaginez pendant cinq vendredis de suite, les gens en passant dans la rue entendaient mon nom de la part des imams. Donc pratiquement, je parle des mosquées et ce n'était pas seulement, euh, bien sûr, euh, à part les gens qui sont déjà dans les mosquées. Vous me dites l'État, qu'est-ce qu'il a fait pour la protection Il faut reconnaître qu'il a mis en œuvre tous les moyens pour la sécurité. Mais ce qui m'a beaucoup étonné de la part d'un État que, qui lui-même a engagé ses réformes, à savoir garantir les libertés individuelles et l'égalité, et aujourd'hui, non seulement il a mis en œuvre, aujourd'hui on a un projet de loi qui va prévoir l'égalité dans l'héritage et peut-être pour les Européens, les Occidentaux, c'est rien l'égalité dans l'héritage. Mais dans notre région, c'est le point, je dirais le socle du patriarcat et c'est un sujet qui est resté tabou pendant des années, pendant des siècles. Pendant des siècles, c'était un sujet tabou et qui n'a jamais été abordé d'une manière publique, notamment par l'État. Aujourd'hui, il devient un sujet non seulement en Tunisie, au Maroc, en Algérie. Aujourd'hui, j'ai vu aussi en Égypte, il y a un, un, donc, un sujet qui était, qui était tabou. Et d'ailleurs, euh, souvent, c'est l'argument religieux, mais parfois aussi, il y a des arguments style « c'est pas le moment ». C'est peut-être aussi la question de dire euh, « on est habitué à ça ». Donc, la, la peur des réformes et des changements. Donc, pour revenir à l'État, l'État, assurer certainement la sécurité et on a vu personnellement sous euh, 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 protection ce qui est bon, rassurant mais c'est un peu euh, quand même euh, comment dire un, 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 une anecdote d'avoir défendu sa liberté du vieil de se retrouver privé d'une bonne partie de sa propre liberté parce que quand on est sous protection policière il y a une privation de sa propre liberté mais ce qui m'a étonné, c'est que l'État soit incapable de prendre des mesures de prévention, c'est-à-dire un État démocratique ou dans une phase de transition démocratique, un État qui lui-même prend l'initiative de faire des réformes fondamentales dans un environnement régional pas forcément favorable. Il y a des pressions de certains pays que je n'ai pas envie de nommer là, et qui s'en sont fait connaître par leurs pratiques répressives et parfois sanguinaires. Mais ce qui m'a étonné, c'est ça. C'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, il n'y a pas eu une position de la part de l'État qui puisse arrêter les humains, stigmatiser et de renforcer la haine vis-à-vis -vis des militants des droits humains et notamment des droits des femmes. Donc, moi, je trouve que cette déclaration, plus que jamais, doit être mise en œuvre par l'État tunisien afin qu'il puisse non seulement prendre des initiatives positives de réformes, c'est très bien, et c'est une grande avancée pour la Tunisie, mais aussi pour la région, mais qu'il puisse garantir à tous, les, à tous les défenseurs des droits humains, et là je parle des droits des femmes et des libertés individuelles, de manière, c'est le cas aujourd'hui en Tunisie, parce que pour les, pour les libertés publiques, quand même, quand même et, euh, il y a ici un membre d'Ali, il y a sa sourire. On ne peut pas dire qu'il y a des persécutions, on ne peut pas dire qu'il y a des menaces, on ne peut pas dire qu'il y a de la diffamation, on ne peut pas dire qu'ils font des pages et des pages, etc. Contrairement à la question des droits des femmes, dans un pays qui est connu pour être euh, défenseur des droits des femmes et pour avoir pris plein de législations depuis plus de 60 ans pour en faveur des femmes. Donc c'est un pays qui a été avant-gardiste et ça veut dire qu'il y a quelque chose qui n'a pas marché, notamment, je pense personnellement, que l'islamisation de la société tunisienne et l'utilisation de la religion afin d'arrêter, de stopper, de bloquer les réformes, ça a commencé bien avant l'arrivée des islamistes en Tunisie.
ça a commencé avec le régime de Nadi, qui pour instaurer un certain autotage, pour instaurer le régime, voulait aussi mettre la religion comme un moyen qui puisse empêcher peut-être les Tunisiens de se sentir libres et de prendre leur propre liberté. Um, I think you highlighted a very important point is that it's not always the states that are standing in the way of human rights defenders and of reform and it's something that we've seen uh, in the Middle East even in Yemen for example it wasn't always the states it was also religious factions tribal factions and I think that's maybe a matter of discussion in this summit so how do we work on that so how do we support the state in protecting this human rights defender space um, next, I really want to speak to you, Pierre. One of the things, um, as I was reading by your background, I found it um, very interesting and inspiring. So I wanted to ask you to tell us about your background, how you became a human rights defender, and also what the situation is like for human rights defenders in Burundi. Merci beaucoup. Pour moi, c'est un grand plaisir d'abord de rencontrer un monde pareil comme défenseur des droits humains. La question que vous me demandez, comment je suis parvenu à défendre les droits humains Je n'avais pas cette tradition, non. Mais quand j'étais emprisonné, arrivé à la prison, ça m'a changé. Au départ, je croyais qu'un prisonnier était quelqu'un à abattre. Je croyais qu'un prisonnier était un grand malfaiteur à prendre. Mais quand je suis arrivé là-bas, j'ai vu mes collègues qui faisaient deux ans, trois ans, ça, les voir nulle part. Alors, vous aussi, je vous dis, si vous, si vous passez deux ans ou trois ans sans apercevoir quelqu'un de vos amis, il faut le chercher soit dans des endroits, soit en prison, ou bien il est mort. Alors quand j'ai trouvé mes collègues à la prison, je me suis dit, et c'est finalement la prison de ça. Alors comment j'ai pu sortir de la prison quand j'étais au crèche de la police, j'ai été torturé. Alors, arrivé à la prison, là aussi, j'ai été torturé. Alors, je me suis dit, c'est ça la vie d'un prisonnier. J'ai fait deux ans. Et ma sortie de la prison, même quand j'étais à la prison, j'ai pensé à ceci. Une fois que je quitte la prison, je ferai rien comme, comme travail. Je vais défendre les droits des prisonniers. Et c'est ce que j'ai fait. Dès ma sortie, j'ai créé une association appelée ABDP, Association pour la défense des droits des prisonniers. Mais le pouvoir me disait que j'allais défendre les criminels. Mais je leur disais, je viens défendre les droits, je ne viens pas défendre les prisonniers, je défends les droits. Alors, mon but était d'humaniser les prisonniers et les prisons. Et je l'ai fait. Depuis 1900, je crois, 1997, j'ai commencé à aider les prisonniers. Et au fur et à mesure, pas que le gouvernement n'était pas totalement d'accord, je les ai convaincus, mais comment je suis arrivé là-bas, j'ai rencontré un ministre aussi qui avait connu la prison. Et il m'a facilité pour agréer l'association. Et quelquefois, je dis que tout m'allait bon. Et voilà, j'ai travaillé. 
jusqu'à maintenant, en 2015, j'avais réellement des prisons, du Burundi, et été Mais à partir de l'année 2015, c'est là où ça me touche beaucoup. Quand je recevais cette étage, cette maison, l'édifice qui a été construit, je crois, même en 50 ans, pour la détruire, ça n'a pas fait qu'il y ait de temps. Et voilà, alors, depuis 2015, c'est que j'avais construit dans les prisons, a été détruit en moins d'une semaine. Je sais que vous entendez parler du Burundi. C'est un petit pays. Allez regarder sur la carte. Vous n'allez pas le voir. C'est un point. Mais un pays qui aujourd'hui qui est connu par le monde entier. Pourquoi À cause des violations qui se commettent dans mon pays. J'ai vu des gens, j'ai entendu des gens qui ne veulent pas se voir ces photos. Ça, c'est très malheureux. Donc, vous voyez que c'était chez nous seulement. C'est-à-dire que ces gens, j'ai compris que les qui travaillent dans la peur. Alors, si vous êtes effacé des droits de l'homme et que vous travaillez dans la peur, vous risquez de perdre le combat. Mais c'est comme ça. Il y a les autres qui disent que un bon défenseur, c'est lui qui est toujours vivant. Je suis d'accord avec vous. Mais mes chers amis, quelquefois, si tu as bien travaillé, si tu as défendu ton peuple, même si tu meurs, tu resteras défenseur. Est-ce que Mandela, aujourd'hui, là où il est, il n'est pas toujours défenseur Est-ce que vous l'avez oublié Voilà l'exemple. Et voilà alors après, quand la population a vu ce que je faisais pour les prisonniers, ils venaient, la population venait avec les doléances, mais je ne pouvais pas les défendre parce que ça ne se trouvait pas dans les objectifs de la première de bonne organisation. Alors je me suis dit comment élargir le champ d'action. J'ai créé une autre association à l'emplacement de la première que j'ai appelée à Prodéage, Association pour la protection des droits humains et des personnes détenues. Aujourd'hui, c'est cette association-là que je dirige jusqu'à aujourd'hui, même que le pouvoir n'a pas toléré jusqu'à ce que le pouvoir actuel a voulu m'éliminer. J'ai échappé à un attentat d'assassinat le 3 août 2015. Mais avant ça, j'ai posé une question à un politicien avec lequel nous étions ensemble dans une émission radiodiffusée. Je lui ai posé la question. Pourquoi vous, les politiciens, vous, vous acceptez de tuer les gens Vous savez ce qu'il m'a qu répondu Il m'a dit ceci. Écoutez, non, vous vous trompez fort. En politique, on ne tue pas. Mais on élimine les obstacles. 